All right. It's right on the dot here uh, in the respect of all the speakers that will be uh, coming on, as well as um, uh, our time that we have. Um, I'd like to introduce our speakers. I'm your moderator for this uh, part of the session. My name is Ken Lee. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for the World uh, Wheelchair Rugby. I'm at your service for um, any uh, consultation or anything you need from me. Please just email me and I'll be able to uh, get back to you. With that, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Cameron Gee, who's a postdoctoral fellow at the University of British Columbia and wheelchair rugby sports science support with a Athletic Canada. He'll be speaking to you on cardiovascular determinants of performance in athletes with tetraplegia. Dr. Gee. Thanks for the introduction, Dr. Lee. Um, so yeah, as mentioned, my name's Cameron. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at i in Vancouver splitting my time between a couple of labs. So one is working with a spine surgeon, another is with um, Kathleen Martin Guinness, who some of you may be familiar with, looking at health behavior, health psychology change. So it's nice to kind of go back to some of my PhD work here and focus on physiology in spinal cord injury. Um, you can see my title here is on cardiovascular determinants of performance in athletes with tetraplegia. Um, just so you know, when I say tetraplegia, that, or I might switch between tetraplegia, quadriplegia, cervical spinal cord injury. Um, it's all the same thing. Um, so with that, I wanted to first start by looking at what some of the limits to, oh, just trying to change screen, look, there we go. Limits to aerobic capacity in athletes with cervical spinal cord injury may be. So when we talk about aerobic exercise capacity, we mean using oxygen um, and it's analogous to endurance exercise performance. So. These limits may be pulmonary in terms of getting the oxygen from the air to the alveoli of the lungs and that diffusing into the bloodstream. They may be cardiovascular limits. So that's taking that oxygenated blood uh, where it's in the, gone from the lungs to the cardiovascular system and pumping it to the exercising muscles, or they may be limits at the muscle themselves in terms of extracting that oxygen from the bloodstream and utilizing it to produce energy. Um, I believe, and hopefully by the end of, of this talk, um, that you'll agree with me that the primary limit to aerobic exercise capacity is cardiovascular in nature. So let's first start by just talking about the exercise response in able-bodied individuals. So when we're upright, so seated or standing, about 70% of our blood volume is below the level of our heart, and the large majority of that is in the veins of the abdomen. At the onset of exercise, this is in able-bodied individuals, cardiovascular centers in the brainstem send messages down the spinal cord in what we call sympathetic pathways that synapse or meet with nerves that exit the cord at the first thoracic to the second lumbar level that then leave the cord and affects things like changes in heart rates, um, how hard the heart can contract, um, so at stroke volume is affected. That's the amount of blood that the left ventricle of the heart can pump to the body each time it beats, um, but also to blood vessels. So it can increase blood pressure and to sweat glands, which um, Dr. Griggs is going to talk about a bit later, I believe. So I'll leave that alone. Um, if someone has a spinal cord injury, these sympathetic pathways may be interrupted and the messages don't get through. So we see they don't have a normal increase in blood pressure, heart rate, stroke volume, and sweating response to exercise. And when we consider that heart rate and stroke volume may be limited, these put together as a product um, result in cardiac output. And this is largely predictive of what someone's aerobic exercise capacity may be. So I just wanted to pull on some research to show that because at the moment I'm just showing a picture and um, telling you what might be happening. Um, this is a study that we published earlier this year where we had, here's able-bodied individuals in red with increasing exercise intensity as a percentage of their peak power output. And you can see a pretty normal heart rate response. So as the demand gets higher, we see an increase in heart rate, as you would expect. But in the tetraplegic individuals, because those messages aren't getting through the cord to tell them to increase heart rate, this is what we see. So a, a slight increase at the start, and then it basically flattens out um, at 100% or at, at max output, it might be around 120 or so. 
But this isn't just a difference between able-bodied and tetraplegic individuals. It can also be a difference between tetraplegic and uh, the non-spinal cord injured individuals that play wheelchair rugby. So here we have wheelchair rugby groups. This is low pointers, mid pointers, and high pointers. The black dots represent the quadriplegic or spinal cord injured athletes and the open squares, the non-spinal cord injured athletes. And you can see that regardless of classification, individuals who do not have spinal cord injury are achieving a higher heart rate, which is it kind of indicative of an intact sympathetic nervous system and the ability to mount a somewhat normal response to exercise. In terms of the heart, this is a meta-analysis that we did a few years ago. So this is basically we took all the studies, um, not, not athletes involved, but we took all the studies compared to the heart in spinal cord injured individuals and the able-bodied individuals using echocardiography, which is basically taking a picture of the heart and measuring its size. And what we found was that in spinal cord injury, the heart itself, or sorry, the left ventricle itself was a bit smaller and the volume of blood that it can fill with is less, meaning that the amount of blood that it pumps out is less. Um, note though that this was at rest and it's not suggesting anything that's happening during exercise. And these reductions may be due to, for one, the loss of neural drive to the heart, so the impairment of the neural pathways. It might be due to inactivity, um, or it may be due to an inability to perform exercise with the larger muscles that require more blood flow and might train the heart a bit better. To try and control for the potential of inactivity or an inability to perform exercise with larger muscles. If I can get to the next slide. There we go. Uh, a group from ICORD here compared tetraplegic athletes and paraplegic athletes. And they found that the volume, so end diastolic volume, the amount that the heart can fill with, and stroke volume, the amount it pumps out each time, were significantly less in the tetraplegic than the paraplegic athletes. So when we control for similar training levels, um, we see that the left volumes are less in tetraplegic, and that means that it must at least in part be due to that loss of neural drive. We can try to look at this during exercise, but not using echocardiography. As you can imagine, when you're cycling with your arms, trying to then take pictures of the moving um, chest uh, isn't particularly easy. So this is using something called the carbon monoxide rebreathe method. Uh, a group from Germany did this a few years back. If we see in the tetraplegic individuals from rest to maximal exercise, there's essentially no change in the stroke volume. So the amount of Blood, the left ventricle of the heart pumps out to the body to supply it with oxygen. But in able-bodied individuals, we see that from rest to what they're calling isomax, so that's at the same intensity at which the tetraplegic individuals were at max, there's a normal response, which is an increase in stroke volume with increasing demand. Uh, more recently, there's been a validated and shown to be a reliable method called oxygen pulse. And this is pretty simply just dividing the oxygen consumption by heart rate because we know that heart rate times stroke volume is equal to cardiac output. Cardiac output is indicative of oxygen consumption. So if we divide VO2 by heart rate, it should give us a proxy measure or surrogate measure of stroke volume. So again, we'll show the able-bodied first. We see a normal increase as exercise intensity increases and then continues to increase throughout at least up to 80% with armogometry, whereas in the tetraplegic individuals, we see very little scope to, or ability to increase their stroke volume from that resting measure. And this is basically what we see when we do a maximal exercise test or submaximal exercise test, sorry, with stages of 0, 20, 40, 60, 80 uh, of their peak power output, able-bodied, it increases up to around 30. And in the tetraplegic individuals, only around 15. When we did a maximal exercise test, I believe it was around 33 that the able body got up to and around 18 the tetraplegics achieved. Um, and these were tetraplegic athletes, I should mention. However, this may not be the case in all athletes with tetraplegia. Some of them may in fact have preserved sympathetic spinal pathways, which means that they can have this normal response to exercise. So the heart rate, stroke volume, sweating, increases in blood pressure that able-bodied individuals have. Um, so if we zoom in at a cross-section of the cord here at the cervical level, uh, 
previous groups have been able to identify, or we believe at least that the sympathetic pathway, so those that take these messages down to the cord that go out to the blood vessels and the heart, uh, pass through the circuit cord in what we call the dorsolateral funiculus. So it is possible that some athletes may, due to the nature of their injury, have these pathways preserved while the rest of the cord or parts of the cord may be injured. So there's a loss of motor function uh, and loss of sensation, but they can at least get a normal sympathetic or cardiovascular response to exercise. And we're able to assess these pathways by something called the sympathetic skin response, typically, which is basically you zap someone and you measure whether they uh, sweat in their palms of their hands or on their feet, um, which indicates those pathways are in fact intact. So we did this, um, this isn't wheelchair rugby, this is 2013 World Paracycling Championships. Um, and we assessed those pathways and then we put heart rate and GPS monitors on athletes during the World Championships. So we called those that had injuries to or didn't have a sweat response autonomic complete, whereas those that were able to sweat and indicative of an intact sympathetic nervous system, autonomic incomplete. And you can see just eyeballing this picture, we can look at times, but the darker colors show they went faster. And those with the complete injury weren't able to go as fast generally as those that had an incomplete injury. And you can see also they weren't able to achieve as high of a heart rate, um, either maximum or average. And I believe that of the eight athletes that competed, the, the athletes that finished first, second and third all had autonomic incomplete, whereas those that finished four through eight all had autonomic complete injuries. So rather than just talk about these are the issues, what are some of the things that we can do to target the cardiovascular system to enhance aerobic exercise performance? Um, these are some things that have been done by other groups. Uh, I'm going to focus on some of the stuff that I did during my PhD because uh, I know that a little better. But basically, everything that's been tried here, whether it's anti-gravity suits, um, stimulating the leg muscles, compression stockings, or placing a stimulator in the spine to try and stimulate blood vessels or the, the nerves that can cause vasoconstriction are all basically trying to prevent blood pooling in the lower limbs or within the abdomen and to get it to come back to the heart because when it comes back to the heart, that's called venous return. It then goes out from the heart to the muscles. One of the ones that we've done a bit of, and this is from my PhD supervisor, Chris West's, PhD was to use abdominal binding. So this is kind of like a corset that's tightened up around the abdomen. Um, and what they found is that when bound, athletes increase their maximal oxygen consumption or aerobic capacity by just over 10%. And while it's important to show this in the lab, they're also able to get out in the field. And they showed that during a four minute push test, which I believe was around a, a running track, um, the maximum amount of distance people were able to push increased significantly. One of the mechanisms that they suggested for this is something called the respiratory muscle pump. Um, I've not been able to come up with a good figure to try and describe the respiratory muscle pump, but I'll just do my best to try and explain it quickly. But basically when we as able-bodied individuals breathe in, we create a negative pressure in our chest. When the diaphragm goes down or descends, it creates a positive pressure in the abdomen. Um, assuming that we have a solid abdominal wall. In spinal cord injury, if there's a loss of neural drive to the abdomen, there might be a loss of that solid abdominal wall. And when the diaphragm descends, rather than increased pressure, the abdominal wall can kind of pop forward. Um, some people refer to it as quad belly. Um, but what increasing pressure does in the abdomen and lowering the thorax is that it helps with getting that blood volume or any fluid to move from a lower area of high pressure in the abdomen to low pressure in the thorax. Um, so we then tried to harness this respiratory muscle pump via respiratory muscle training. And I know uh, someone's gonna speak about that in a minute, but basically respiratory muscle training, we did train both the inspiratory and expiratory muscles. And I know I'm running out of time, so I'll make this quick. Um, but we strengthened inspiratory muscles by about 30% expiratory muscles by around 20% over a six week time frame, And what we saw was an improved work rate of about 15% and uh, oxygen consumption by about the same. And there's a couple of reasons why that might be. Um, very quickly, one simply is that when the lungs, what we saw was that with restriction muscle training, we saw a drop in the lung volumes. 
If the lungs are really full, they take up space and that can prevent the heart from filling. Uh, at the same time, if the lungs are full and the pressure is high, they can also impinge on the blood vessels going through the pulmonary system and prevent blood flow from the right to the left side of the heart to then be pumped out. And I'm just going to skip these two on autonomic dysreflexia um, and bring it to the conclusions because I'm on the last minute here. But what I wanted to highlight from the, this presentation was that most tetraplegic athletes have impaired cardiovascular response to exercise, but not all. And interventions that target the cardiovascular system to reduce blood pooling, enhance the blood coming back to the heart from the body, or improve cardiac output have proven effective in enhancing aerobic exercise capacity. And finally, I think it would be uh, remiss of me not to mention classification here. Um, this is a, a statement from the Paralympic website that classification aims to minimise the impact an impairment has on performance. Um, and I think it's pretty clear from the data that we have available that impairments in the sympathetic nervous system uh, clearly is an impairment that impairs performance um, that we can't really change. And ultimately, it does play a role in determining whether an athlete or a team can be successful. And then I'd just like to acknowledge my PhD supervisor, Chris West, um, study participants that I've used throughout some of the studies presented here and those that I've collaborated with on these studies. Thanks. And I guess we've got a few minutes for questions. Thanks, Dr. G. Um, very interesting. Um, uh, no questions in the chat box, but I do have a question. Is it Safe to um, translate what you're saying, in, you know, especially when you did the, uh, show that one study about um, or that tracking of the athletes, whether they're complete or incomplete, uh, translate that data or that information to say um, the incompletes have actually more advantage while on the court. So, I mean, I think it's safe to say that. So I'll start with paracycling and which rugby and obviously not a, all that similar of a sport. There's no, not really as much skill involved in paracycling. So changes in physiology are going to have a much larger impact. Um, so in wheelchair rugby, I think it was those that have these pathways impaired, they're clearly not going to be able to perform as well on say that four minute push test um, or any repeat sprint tests that um, teams may do. Um, but there's going to be a whole lot more that comes into the play with all the skills that are involved. So they may be just as good a player or even better player if, if their skill set is better. Um, but again, that goes back to the classification or system where it's, that would be what I consider to be sporting excellence rather than an effect of the impairment. Thank you. There's one question in the chat box. Is it possible for HR response to be preserved, but sweating response impaired yeah so i've not seen it um i believe they use the same pathways going through the spine so you can see here it's just that when so they all go through the spine the sympathetic pathways acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter um, from the cord to the postganglionic neuron but then from this point forward acetylcholine is responsible for changes in sweat whereas norepinephrine is responsible for changes in blood pressure, heart rate, cardiac contractility. So my assumption, though, I haven't, I can't say there's any uh, research that's been done on that specifically, is that it would be very difficult to preserve one without the other. That would have to be an injury to something um, beyond the um, sympathetic para or parasympathetic ganglion chain. Um, no other questions, but... Um... Uh, Jack Whitlam uh, commented that, uh, you know, it's too bad we didn't give you a uh, lot more time because the topic is really interesting. I agree with all the other uh, presentations so far. So uh, this is our first. So guys, uh, more to come every year. Uh, that's our goal. All awesome. right. Thanks. I'm looking forward to some of the other presentations coming up as well. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gee. Thanks. All right. Uh, in just time, we'll keep going. Um, Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Claudio Pere or Perez. Sorry if I messed that name up. He's a senior researcher at Swiss Paraplegic uh, Center in uh, Notville, not well, investigating strategies to improve Paralympic performance with focus on physiology and nutrition.
He'll be uh, talking about respiratory muscle training for wheelchair rugby players. Dr. Pere, I don't know if I say that name right or not. Yeah, that's correct. So thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting me. Um, I think uh, Cameron already showed some slides I will present you as well. So we have a little bit more time to focus maybe on practical aspects in the end of the presentation. So what you can expect from my presentation is I want to briefly show you some slides to the respiratory muscle function in spinal cord injury, present some muscle training methods, and then focus a little bit on respiratory muscle training in wheelchair rugby players. Um, also giving you some questions, limitations, and, and practical aspects. So if you look at the respiratory muscles of enabled body persons, you can see on the left-hand side, like the innervation of these muscles from the spinal cord and the green part is, is the inspiratory muscle part and the red um, colored muscles are the expiratory muscles. And if you now have a quick look at what happens if you have, for example, a spinal cord injury at the level of C5, C6, then this will happen. So there are many muscles of the respiratory pump which will be no more involved in respiratory function in these persons. And so, of course, this means uh, a severe limitation of respiration. So this limited respiratory function um, leads to some decreases in performance, maybe, but also in, in respiratory muscles. And the question arises, can we train this or at least keep what this person still has left to work with? And in general, there are some potential respiratory muscle training methods available nowadays. So there is uh, endurance training, which is done by means of isocopnic hyperpnea training. Or on the other hand, you have uh, the possibility to do strength training by taking resistance for in or expiration or the combination of both. And since about one or two years, there exists a device which can also combine endurance and strength training at the same time. If you look at the studies concerning respiratory muscle training in wheelchair rugby players, they are mainly performed in the field of strength training. But before I start with some results from these studies, there was an interesting study in 2013, which showed that wheelchair rugby training per se already improved pulmonary function in persons with a tetraplegia. But these persons were not athletes, they were just uh, like recreational uh, persons with a tetraplegia. But if you think a little bit further, we could turn things around and maybe ask, would it be possible that respiratory muscle training improves wheelchair rugby performance? And that's exactly what the studies were looking at. If we look at the general field in spinal cord injury, we can say, or there was a review about this some years ago, which showed that inspiratory muscle training um, can enhance inspiratory muscle strength, of course, but also endurance and vital and inspiratory capacity. So this does, of course, not mean that this also leads to a performance enhancement. If we look at athletes with a tetraplegia, rugby players, so um, Chris West or Cameron, we, who talked before, then they could show or stated that inspiratory muscle training increased diaphragm thickness, peak work rate, which is, for example, power output and exercise tidal volume, which is all helpful, of course, to enhance performance. The effects on peak oxygen uptake, they were a little bit inconclusive. Maybe Cameron can comment on this later on if, if he wants to. So 
there are some tendencies which also show that peak oxygen uptake is also increased. And the latest study I found in this field was, was the one of Cameron who presented it a little bit earlier. I want to go a little bit into more detail. What he did in his study was he combined inspiratory muscle training and expiratory muscle um, strength training in the study. And you, you can see that this was done with this device presented on the left upper side, which is called a power lung device. It's just a simple mechanical device where you can um, induce some re resistance for the training. And as you can see, the training lasted six weeks. The athletes trained five days per week and did two sessions per day, um, 30 breaths against the resistance during each session. So this takes you about maybe five minutes to train or maybe a little bit more, but not more than 10 minutes. And you can see they started at the inspiratory and an expiratory maximal pressure of about around 60, 65% of the max pressure. And then they were, during the training period, they were, they were of course able to increase performance, which ended at around 85 or 80. Uh, 80% of the maximal inspiratory pressure. What they assessed was uh, resting pulmonary function, rest your cardiac function, exercise capacity, submaximal exercise performance responses, and lung volumes and, and field-based exercise performance. So after six weeks of respiratory muscle training, um, they found, of course, an increase in maximal in and expiratory pressure, which is of course, the thing you train, and also in peak expiratory flow. Um, there was also an increase in VO2 peak, as shown before, and also in peak power. During uh, exercise, they could find uh, a decreased hyperinflation, which is also a good thing, but they didn't find any significant change in resting lung volume or in cardiac adaptations. And what you also can see is that if you stop training, so six weeks later, when they, they stopped respiratory muscle training, um, the values of, for example, work rate and peak oxygen uptake decrease more or less back to the basic values pre-study. So if you look at the studies there is only a small number available so there's maybe one or two more in this field especially with wheelchair rugby athletes and there are some studies where a control group is missing so it's difficult to to do evidence-based conclusions and also if you look at the rugby players you have to keep in mind that there are different lesion levels different uh, completeness of the lesion and also different function of, of the respiratory mu muscles. Another question which arises is, what is the mechanism behind this respiratory muscle training success? Um, I think it's not a cardiovascular adaptation which can be found or it's still discussed, but, but it's maybe not the reason for the performance enhancement. And another question which uh, practitioners and coaches always ask is, what about the intensity and the duration of training? In a study with patients, we found that um, intensity is more important than the duration of the training. So it's also boring just to breathe through a hole in and out against the resistance. So you should keep the the training as short as possible. And you could see that it's also possible within um, 30 breaths, two times per day, five times a week, that you will have some um, benefits. Some practical aspects is also what we experience sometimes is that you should um, timing the respiratory muscle training um, in view also of the physical training process to avoid fatigue. Because Christoph Leich, who joined in hand cyclist, he did a respiratory warm up against resistance and he could show the performance after 
this respiratory warm up decreased, although we expected something different. And this means maybe, or the explanation for this might be that, that the respiratory muscles are fatigued and performance can also be um, decreasing. So this is something which is not a direct respiratory muscle training method, but uh, also shown before in the presentation that abdominal binders, they can help because you have a mechanical advantage and higher oxygen uptakes were found a higher stroke volume and a better efficiency of respiration. And maybe also one thing to think about is in a retrospective study, we could show that persons or patients who showed a higher maximal inspiratory pressure than 90 centimeters of water, they never experienced a pneumonia, whereas the others very often had a pneumonia. So this means maybe the inspiratory muscle training might also prevent from problems, complications, which also helps, of course, indirectly for the athletic performance because then they are not sick because they have no pneumonia and they are able to train. So my recommendation for you is just keep an eye. It's an interesting method. Keep an eye on it and just try to do it, the respiratory muscle training, I think it can really help to enhance performance in wheelchair rugby. Thanks for your attention. Great, that, thank you, Dr. Parish. That probably this is one of the most interesting ones to, uh, easiest one to try to train an, a wheelchair athlete, um, uh, owning a, uh, a uh, wheelchair lacrosse team. We're doing everything we can to do that as well. Couple of questions here. Um, what's the name of the combined device to train pulmonary function? So this is called uh, the combined. So the one where you can do um, resistive and endurance training together. So it's called P100. P100, right? Yeah, but it's, uh, it's quite difficult to use for, for persons with a tetraplegia, I also have to say. Okay. And your recommendation for timing of the uh, res respiratory muscle training? Yeah, it's just... Uh, so you should just have some time between the respiratory muscle training and the physical training. So I recommend to do the respiratory muscle training maybe uh, in, the, in the evening after the, the physical training or when they have a day off maybe, or beside just this physical training. But what we also recommend is to stop respiratory muscle training about four to five days before a competition to avoid just uh, fatigue, which you don't want to have. Um, I have a question as well. Um, so all this intensity training, is there any data or science behind how long this uh, uh, benefit uh, lasts uh, and, or when do we see the tapering off of it? Yeah, I think so. If you look at the data from Cameron, so we know that about six weeks later you lost the benefits, but but I think so. Maybe it lasts three to four weeks. So I wouldn't make a break longer than three to four weeks. Okay, great. And I might have missed it on your talk. Would the passive training make any difference? Such as um, I, I remember some of our athletes having their caregivers do like abdominal thrust, you know, for several um, times prior to the um, event or several days prior to. I don't know if that makes any since I never really looked up whether there's a science behind that or not. Mm, so you mean abdominal thrust, you mean just inspire as, as much as possible or? What? Right, so there's an external force pushing the abdomen just as we, uh, we try to do a, um, uh, like a forced cough, for instance. Okay. Yeah. Would that make any difference? I, I don't know, I don't know any data about this, but I cannot explain. I, I would not expect something, but it's more like a feeling of the gut and not a, not evidence-based. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I maybe an old wives tale. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, thank you very much. And I, Cameron has posted a few uh, information for everyone as well. Thank you, Dr. Perry. Okay, so you're welcome. All right, going into the next speaker. Um, Dr. Katie Griggs, she's a senior lecturer at Nottingham Trent University with a focus on thermal regulation
health and sport performance in persons with disability, in particular those with spinal cord injury. Um, she'll be talking to you about keeping your cool, heat related issues and practical application for wheelchair rugby players. Dr. Griggs. Thank you very much for the introduction and also the invite to talk to you today. So firstly, I wanted just to put wheelchair rugby into the rest of the Paralympic sports and look at the risk of thermal strain. So this figure is um, showing subjective determination of thermal strain of different wheelchair and um, different Paralympic sports, looking at the combination of environmental and sporting demands, which is shown on the X axis, and then also the proportion of athletes that have an impairment of which they have um, an inability to thermoregulate effectively. By thermoregulate, I mean the controlling body temperature. If we look at where wheelchair rugby sits within these sports, you see in terms of the environmental and sporting demands, it's just over halfway. So even though it's an indoor sport, in terms of the sporting demands, in terms of the intensity, it's high intensity, frequent um, sprints, as well as having a good aerobic base for athletes. In terms of the portion of athletes that have an inability to thermoregulate effectively, a large portion of athletes, as we already mentioned today in today's conference, have a spinal cord injury of a high level lesion, so tetraplegia. And these individuals have particular issues with thermoregulation. There are a couple of other disability groups I've touched on as well. So firstly, I'm gonna to touch on a spinal cord injury disability group. So these individuals, as um, Dr. Gee has already mentioned, have a loss of sweating capacity and blood flow control below the lesion level. And the evaporation of sweat and also the control, so the vasodilation of skin blood flow, uh, vasodilation of blood vessels at the skin surface to lose heat by convection are the main ways you lose heat from the body. So due to the small amount of active muscle mass, for individuals with a spinal cord injury, they produce a low amount of heat when they uh, exercise. But due to their reduced capacity for heat loss, down to the loss of sweat sweating capacity and blood flow, they're actually still at a heightened thermal strain. So they're not producing much heat, but because they struggle to get rid of it, they're actually, um, they're gaining a lot of heat. So maintaining that heat within the body. Another issue is they're unable to perceive the magnitude of thermal strain. Um, so due to the small amount of sensitive skin that they have with high level lesions, they aren't able to predict the, the, the high degree of thermal strain they're under um, during play. Another disability group is athletes with cerebral palsy. So these individuals have a lower efficiency of movement and a high energy cost than able-bodied athletes, leading to an earlier onset fatigue. Now, in the cerebral palsy, there's a kind of a, a, a continuum um, and of the um, impairment and can be very diverse from one individual to the next. They also potentially might have reduced awareness of perception of effort. So if they're doing kind of multiple sprints, potentially when getting quite hot, they may not back off and reduce their pacing as they don't perceive to be um, the effort to be any different, which could lead to an increased core temperature response. Also, the last group I'm going to touch on is athletes with amputation. So these individuals have a reduced surface area of evaporation and convective heat loss due to the small amount of body surface area. In, also, they also have in their kind of liners over the residue limb, they may have sweat accumulation. Um, this may lead to decreased thermal comfort, skin breakdown, and also bacterial infection of that residue limb, which can lead to potential um, health related problems. So when we're looking at the game of wheelchair rugby and the different players on court with the different impairment groups, are there any particular players of a heightened risk of thermal strain? So during one study, we looked at the game of wheelchair rugby and looked at comparing athletes with a spinal cord injury, so athletes with tetraplegia wheelchair rugby players. Um, there was nine players compared to seven players with a non-spinal related um, impairment. We tracked their core temperature across the match and also looked at activity profiles. So during the match, um, we found there was an increased core temperature in the athletes with a spinal cord injury, continue increase throughout the whole match. Compared to in a non-spinal related impairment group, you have that initial increase, which you expect, 
you're producing more heat at the start. At the end of the, the first quarter, they maintain heat balance um, and only have a change in core temperature around 0.5 degrees Celsius. If we look at then in terms of the distance covered, the spinal injury group cover a much shorter distance across every quarter compared to the non-spinal group, their mean speed, their peak speed, and the amount of time in the high intensity activity zones was much lower than the non-spinal related um, group. So you'd expect that obviously the athletes with a spinal cord injury were producing much less heat than the athletes with a non-spinal related injury, but they're still having that continuous increase in core temperature throughout the match. And we also had to stop one of the players at the end of the second quarter. They were at um, a core, core temperature of 39.5 degrees. Um, ethically, I'm not allowed to test past that point for this study, so they had to be removed from the study. At the very end, on average, athletes were um, in the spinal group, 39.3 degrees, compared to 38.6 in the non-spinal group. So you can see the difference in um, core temperature response. And skin temperature showed a similar response. An area that's often looked into is the post-exercise recovery. So this is a nice study by Maloney, and we've seen similar responses in 20 degree environment after intermittent exercise. This study looked at 30 minutes of exercise in 35 degree heat, um, following which they had passive recovery in that condition for 45 minutes. So the graph on the left shows um, the athletes of tetraplegia compared to um, athletes with um, able-bodied individuals. So you can see even after 45 minutes of passive recovery, they're still having an increase in their core temperature response, whereas in the able-bodied group, they're merely returning to their resting levels. The right-hand side shows um, individuals with high and low paraplegia, again, showing a similar response to the able-bodied with a slight and heightened response for athlete, um, individuals with a high paraplegia. This shows it's really important that post-exercise recovery to think about kind of corner strategy to implement to make sure you're not having that continuous increase for these individuals, particularly when you're looking at competitions where you have round rob robin tournaments and you're going to, after one match, potentially play another match later on. So really looking at bringing down that core temperature response. So cooling strategies promote evaporative heat loss, so the mix of fan and water are likely to be the most effective in that post-exercise period. This figure here shows some kind of key, perform um, key components for sport and performance and how can optimize performance. So the different kind of sections, so looking at the athlete and the impairment group, the physical capacity, the competition environments and the ambient conditions, and the equipment, so the equipment user interface and maintenance. So when thinking about what strategies we can implement to help these individuals with their thermal relation um, during match play, we need to take all these things into account. So strategies that we can adopt are firstly cooling methods um, equipment innovations and heat acclimation acclimatization and also fluid nutritional practices, all of which I'm going to touch on in today's presentation. I won't go into the fluid nutritional practices because um, I know there's a presentation after me on nutrition um, and that's not my area of expertise. But what I would say is really important to have a hydration strategy alongside a cooling method strategy in place. So first thing I'll talk about cooling methods. There are a number of cooling methods that individuals can use to bring about um, a reduction in skin and core temperature, a number of which are shown in this slide. And you've probably seen them either use them yourself or see them in the various media, um, especially out in Tokyo in the recent Paralympic and, and Olympic Games. This is taken from a review paper by Bongas um, a few years ago now, looking at different cooling strategies and the feasibility of implementing them both before um, play, during play, and also in post cooling, and looking at the effectiveness of each of these strategies. This is based on an, an able bodied research. But again, you can use some of this information for a large majority of athletes and wheelchair rugby players. So it's kind of showing in terms of using the cooling vest. Um, and water spreads, et cetera, at different points um, within the match. In terms of players with a spinal cord injury, particular question marks on using the cold water or ice lower ingestion for these individuals. 
there's limited research in this area and what has been shown anecdotally is showing that um, they potentially have gastrointestinal discomfort when using these strategies that due to the larger volume that had to be taken on to have the cooling effectiveness and then, then the need to go to the toilet more, this may not be that um, feasible for these individuals. But again, there's, there's a real lack of research in this area. The second one is cold, uh, cold water immersion, especially kind of looking at whole body immersion. The feasibility of doing that for a lot of these athletes is going to be difficult. So again, the question mark of, of using that um, strategy as well. In terms of athletes with a spinal cord injury, there's been a few studies looking at different um, methods, those shown on the slide here. Um, and the conclusions that can be drawn from the research that has been on this area is a combination of cooling methods. So both pre-cooling, so prior to match play and during breaks in play, so breaks in quarters and half time, is likely to be the most effective response um, for these individuals. If we're looking at pre-competition, using a cooling or ice vest, so similar to kind of Bonga's work from the review paper, is probably going to be the most practical and have the most feasible and also the most effectiveness. During breaks in play, using water sprays and the combination of sprays and fans um, would be appropriate to use. And that post-recovery, post as previous shown in the graphs, using again water sprays and fans to bring about that continual increase in core temperature following match play. One thing I do need to note, and again, apologies that these aren't the best infrared images ever, um, is about the fit of cooling garments. So these images are showing in the top line, looking at prior to wearing a cooling garment, the middle line where you see the blue and the stripes of black, they're actually ice blocks within a ice vest. The athletes wore this ice vest for 30 minutes before removal, and then the the very bottom images are looking at the removal of vest after that 30 minute period. So you can see in athlete B and C, there's a different amount of um, yellow regions, so cooler regions on both the torso and the back, really showing that that's exactly the same garment on two different individuals, but the amount of surface area cooled is quite different between these two athletes. Now these garments be made are made to warm when you're standing up, not when you're sitting down or in a wheelchair. Also, these individuals would have had some binding across the um, middle region, again, affecting the fit. So what happens, they wear a vest, they wear the cooling vest over the top to prevent skin burns. Um, but when they're seated, obviously, the contact from the clothing, the contact then against the skin, um, bunches up um, and you get less contact and therefore less cooling effect is cooling effectiveness. So maybe some regions are looking at whether actually there should be more cooling vests which are shortened and more appropriate for individuals in a wheelchair. What I do have to stress if any of, the, any of these um, cooling methods is practicing. So not implementing the first time in a competition environment, but practicing them within, within training. And again, alongside a hydration strategy. The figure on the right here is actually taken from a field hockey example, but again, just shows you how it should be a really implemented strategy. So looking at pre, mid and post cooling, the different methods you implement and practice and where that occurs, whether they're going to wear it during warm up when they arrive, et cetera, and making sure that's a really implemented strategy for all individual athletes. Some kind of practical tips to the cooling methods. Different methods are appropriate for different um, it, players of different disabilities. And again, looking at how effective is that individual athlete, because again, there'll be some differences from one athlete to the next. There'll be some constraints in the sport, which you may or may not be able to use, um, and also working this existing equipment that the athletes use. So you're not gonna apply uh, cooling the hands before you go out and play, obviously it's gonna severely affect your dexterity. And as well, some of the players, especially in the players of spinal cord injuries tend to wear gloves as well. You need to look at covering the, the largest surface area covered as possible without having any detrimental effects on the individual and you're calling non-active parts for the um, gameplay and not calling active parts prior to going out to play the match. In terms of logistics and feasibility, looking at the facilities that are available at competition sites, whether there's a freezer so you can um, put an ice vest in, whether there's a plug if you've got a fan or whether you've got a battery powered fan, all these things to think about. Also thinking about the combination of methods and if that's possible um, to really increase the effectiveness of cooling for these individuals. And as I mentioned, the effect on hydration, there's been some work that's shown that 
individuals that use cooling methods, they may reduce their hydration, um, which can obviously have a detrimental effect. So it's making sure it's a really practical strategy, the com combination of fluid and also the cooling methods alongside. So next we want to talk about heat acclimation and acclimatization. So this figure is taken from a review paper by um, Gibson looking at all the physical adaptions that can come, come about through um, heat acclimation in a body population. So the term heat acclimation, what that means is exposing the individual to a number of heat exposures over a number of days to bring about physical adaptions to make them better able to cope in the heat, but also um, bring about adaptions for um, improving exercise performance and cardiovascular adaptions as well as thermolator adaptions. In um, individuals with spinal cord injury, there's been a couple of papers that use elite um, um, athletes um, and their main findings are highlighted here. So what they've shown is after a period of heat acclimation or acclimatization, I'll come on to what those two differences mean in a minute, um, they have a reduction in resting heart rate and also exercise heart rate after the heat acclimation, also reduction in core temperature and exercise core temperature, and increase in plasma volume, which brings about some kind of thermolator stability um, and also cardiovascular functions, as mentioned by uh, Dr. D in his talk. So if you're exercising, if you can exercise at a lower resting core temperature, um, that's going to increase your performance and also both physically and also cognitive performance. If you can start your match play at a lower core temperature, you've got a um, longer time to increase your core temperature before you're going to hit some critical core temperature values where you might see to see some negative effects of those higher core temperature regions. What you're unlikely to see, or you won't see, in, especially for athletes with tetraplegia, is you're not going to get the physiological response in terms of the respect response, which is a key response in terms of the adaptions you'll see in um, able-bodied athletes when applying heat acclimation. So, so there's two main studies that looked at heat acclimation and acclimatization in athletes, um, in elite athletes with spinal cord injury. The first one is looking at heat acclimation, and by that term, I mean it's an artificial heat um, exposure. So this was using a climatic chamber. Some people use saunas, etc. But it's an artificial heat exposure. It was a seven-day heat acclimation protocol. It was five Paralympic shooters with a spinal cord injury and 35 degrees and 65% relative humidity. They only did 20 minutes of arm crank at around moderate intensity, followed by 40 minutes of rest um, straight afterwards. And that was another consecutive seven days. The second study, which again was actually by Dr. Gee, who's already been presented today, was looking at heat acclimation. So that's using the unnatural environment um, to use your heat exposure. This is a five day protocol, again, consecutive heat acclimation protocol using 11 wheelchair rugby players with a spinal cord injury around 36 degrees and a kind of low humidity of about 21%. So their heat acclimation protocol followed an indoor training session of which then had a 60 minute protocol um, outside and doing other track work or sprints to maintain a core temperature of around 38.5 degrees. This is a common way to uh, acclimatize individuals is kind of clamping individuals core temperature around that 38.5 degrees um, to make sure you continue to have and maximize those physiological adaptions. As you go through the days of the heat acclimation, you'll start to have a lower core temperature for the same exercise. So therefore you need to make sure you're really maximizing and still hitting that 38.5 degrees on each day of the heat acclimation. As you probably seen in my earlier graphs, you've that continual increase in core temperature to athletes with spinal cord injury. Clamping core temperature around 38.5 is particularly difficult. So um, practically doing this can be a bit more tricky with these individuals having to cool the individual, down because they don't rise above that 38.5 degree value. So the results of these two studies show that in the heat acclimation, so this artificial heat, they saw a reduction in core temperature, in resting core temperature by 0.3 degrees. And then during the actual session, so the last seven day um, session, they saw a, a decline of 0.5 degrees in core temperature. They saw an increase in their plasma volume and a reduction, even though it was slight in their thermal perception, so I have some, some queries around that. But again, no sweat secretion was detected in these individuals, as you would expect. 
In the heat acclimation, um, acclimatization protocol, they saw a reduction in resting heart rate and increase in plasma volume, although it was non-significant, there's only a small amount of players they had in this study. There was no change in thermal perceptions and there was an increase in left ventricular function. So even though you're seeing some adaptions in terms of the heat acclimation response, again, you're having a benefit in terms of the cardiovascular function response. So then when you go to compete in 20 degree environment, which is what an indoor sports hall where wheelchair rugby is played, you're still having a benefit of this protocol. So the kind of main conclusions from these two studies is that it, um, athletes with a spinal cord injury potentially could reach a partial heat acclimation. So it still might be beneficial for them to undertake this response, but it's a highly individualized response from one athlete to the next in terms of how great a benefit will be um, for their thermalation improvement. Now you're probably thinking, I started my presentation talking about how um, a high core temperature potential issues in terms of performance and also health and safety. And now I'm talking about exposing individuals to high heat. So there is particularly a safety issue with performing um, heat acclimation in, um, with athletes with spinal cord injury. So it's really making sure they don't go above that 38.5 degrees of using that kind of clamping method um, and really is a controlled environment of which to undertake. Also looking at the best method to use is artificial heat um, in a climate chamber or sauna or using the natural environment if you're lucky enough to live in a hot climate. The duration, so typically most um, protocols are around seven days, but they can be up to 15 days in um, duration. But making sure if you're doing exercise in the heat, it has no detrimental effects on subsequent performance and effect of, of future performance in terms of their recovery. And also when to implement. So to get the most benefit from these protocols, you need to implement as close as possible to your competition. Um, in the able-bodied research, it shows that for every one day of heat acclimation, it takes two days to lose those physiological adaptions that you've gained from that protocol. You may want to do it at some at near the competition and then re-acclimatize when you get out to the competition venue. And that seems to be a faster response than the initial heat exposure. And the bath on there is to show that it can also be done passively. So you exercise first and then get in a kind of a hot bath with that passive heat exposure. There's also been some research in a body that will have some effects. But again, the logistics and the feasibility of this may not be appropriate for this population group. I lastly want to touch on equipment innovations and particularly on technology riding core temperature measurements that can be used that are non-invasive to measure your in to predict what your internal uh, core body temperature might be. Oh, I do want to raise some questions on both these devices. So the one on the right, uh, one on the left, sorry, is a sensory smart band. It's actually measuring surface temperature to give you a value on saying it's core temperature. Um, I've used this, we have something in our lab and it's very questionable the result you're going. So I'd really question if you're looking at purchasing one of those. Uh, the one on the right is a core device. Um, this uses heat flux, which is the transfer of um, energy, um, skin temperature, and also heart rate. It's worn a heart rate strapping on the side um, of the chest. And these are around 200 pounds per unit. So we've done some work in, in um, our own lab. We're yet to get around to finishing due to COVID, but another paper has come out comparing it to rectal temperature, which is kind of gold standard way of measuring core temperature. And it's shown in both cool and hot environments. There's a good, good reliability of this core device. So on repeated exposures, it's bringing about the same core temperature response, but it's really questionable in terms of validity. So is it actually measuring a core temperature or predicting core temperature well compared to the rectal temperature? And what's particular concern is around the, the higher core temperature regions of around 39 degrees, where people tend to find they might be having some heat illness responses or affecting cognitive performance. Again, so people can operate at higher core temperatures. It under predicts um, core temperature compared to the rectal temperature. So if you're relying on this as your measure, then it could be a bit more questionable, those higher core temperature regions. But again, it does show the kind of the pattern of core temperature response, but using the absolute core temperature may still be questionable. And the similar results we found in our own lab as well. I have to note also, if you're gonna use it with athletes with spinal cord injury, their heart rate response in terms of the maximum heart rate may be different. So using the heart rate value within the logarithm could be questionable as well. The last one I touch on um, is wheel air. So this is integrated backrest into um, wheelchairs, um, particularly daily wheelchairs. We've done some um, work with a student project which is currently unpublished, 
looking at effectiveness in a kind of fizzle activity sense, just doing some low intensity pushing. And you can see from the infrared images where the channels of the wheeler on, on the backrest itself with the kind of black darker regions on the bottom images on the screen. So we've showed this is 60 minutes of pushing and 15 minutes blocks of pushing that at the end of block four. Um, there was actually a decrease in lower back skin temperature of 2.2 uh, 2 degrees compared to so when the fans are on in the backrest compared to when the fans weren't on, a two degree difference um, after that 16 minute protocol. So maybe some use again, having this type of technology um, before and after gameplay, when they finish play and they're cooling down, um, sorry, not cooling down, going back to their um, accommodational cars, et cetera, to just put those fans on to bring about further cooling. So thank you very much for listening and also the invite for today. Um, if you've got any more questions after today, um, there's my email address if you want to contact me. Thank you, Dr. Griggs. Uh, so I got some questions, but there is a question in the uh, chat box. Previous questions uh, were answered by Vicky. Uh, would you recommend implementing both heat acc acclimation and uh, acclimatization and pre per and post cooling around competition wheelchair rugby? If so, would you gain much from using both strategies over one alone? Yeah, really interesting question. It hasn't actually been looked at using kind of both heat acclimation and cooling in one particular research due to the difficulty, especially in the, um, the heat acclimation protocols. Um, potentially, yes. From, so from the heat acclimation, you're going to get more longer term effects. So more than just the kind of um, acute effects of cooling on that day. And like I say, it may have benefits for kind of cardiovascular function as well. The cooling is going to have effects at acute level. So during that one session, that one competition, bringing down that core temperature, skin temperature straight after a match or doing it before a match to make sure you're starting a match at a much lower core temperature or skin temperature to start with. So potentially, yes, there, there could be benefits of using a combination. Part of it is also the feasibility. So being able to implement a heat acclimation protocol prior to doing a major competition could be quite tricky, again, depending on the effects and other parts of training. So again, the feasibility of, of doing both is really questionable from a more practical side, but from a research side, then potentially yes. I guess uh, a lot of the serious um, athletes will be keeping an eye on all this and take any advantage possible. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, another question is, have you done any uh, core temperature monitoring during practice and training camps? I'm assuming it's uh, rugby, wheelchair rugby, but maybe it's other sports as well. Yeah, so my earlier um, slide, if I can go back. Um, this was taken during um, match play. This one here, this study here, was taken during match play. Um, so that was a simulated competition. It wasn't at a international competition or anything. Um, but again, that was during during match play itself um, in, in wheelchair rugby, yeah. So again, we looked at the activity profiles using indoor tracking system and we tracked their core temperature throughout the, the match using um, telemetric pills that you kind of swallow and gives you um, GI, gastrointestinal core temperature as your measure of core temperature. I know uh, when I, uh, when I'm going to share this information with our coaches and everything, the coaches are going to really want to know how to how to use all this uh, data or information. From. <laughs> I have a question uh, from running a medical clinic for events, whether it's uh, wheelchair rugby or ad other adaptive sports. Uh, we utilize uh, when we first thing that we can utilize is the cooling vest if someone comes in already overheated. But I'm looking at your um, talk that. Um, uh, at post event, it's not the most helpful thing. Uh, from a medical clinic side, uh, besides the immersion uh, techniques that we uh, we may have uh, on the side, we have uh, like the um, poor men's versions all set up and all that <laughs> without the cooling tubs. But um, is there any other suggestions? Because um, I'm used to just throwing uh, cooling vests on top of the uh, vets that's coming in, or I'm sorry, athletes that are coming in wheelchairs with uh, who's already overheated. Yeah, so as you mentioned, kind of depending on the disability and, and um, the mobility of the athlete itself. So water immersion is great if you if that's feasible to get someone to cool down as quick as possible. And again, it depends on how hot they are. 
you don't want a situation where you're actually cooling down too quickly. Um, so it really depends on, on their state and also their disability as well. Um, but water sprays and fanning is really effective and cheap tool um, that can be done. And again, it can be multiple athletes you could call at the same time as well if needed to be. Um, but yeah, kind of cold water immersion if, if particularly uh, for some athletes if it's feasible. Again, cooling, cooling garments depends on the cooling garments. They're quite varied, the different garments you can get and the cooling effectiveness um, and the body surface area you can, you can cool as well. So again, it depends on which garments you're using. Great. Uh, do you know of any study that has uh, done on different type of cooling garments and what? Yeah, were there is a study, I believe it's by Tyler, um, and I can probably dig it out for you after today, um, which has looked at different garments in an able-bodied population, but again, still will be relevant. Um, I think the issue sometimes in um, with wheelchair players, as I mentioned, is, is sometimes the fit is very different when you're seated, again, with binding and that contact with the skin. Um, so yeah, so there is some, there is a study that has looked at the different combination, sorry, different um, vests and how they compare in terms of their cooling effectiveness. Well, that would be great if that could be shared with this group. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Dr. Griggs. Um, great talk. All right, with our moving on, I'd like to introduce Dr. Joel Fluek, uh, a researcher at, and nutritionist at the Swiss Paral Paralytic Center investing the role of nutrition and health and performance in population ranging from patients to Paralympic athletes. Uh, she'll be talking to you about nutrition consideration for wheelchair rugby. Dr. Fulick, all yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, are you seeing my screen uh, properly? Yes, we are. Okay, perfect. So I will talk about uh, the nutritional consideration uh, for wheelchair rugby, and I will try to cover in the next 25 minutes uh, some different topics uh, ranging, oops, ranging from body composition to energy expenditure, as well as the macronutrients uh, guidelines, uh, requirements, hydration, micronutrients, and supplementation. So I will start with the body composition. Uh, we know very well that body composition changes um, after the incidence of a spinal cord injury. And as you can see here on this slide, um, if you compare a body composition of the athletes with a spinal cord injury uh, with those uh, from the control, so able-bodied um, individuals, then you can see that um, the athletes with the spinal cord injuries have an increase in fat mass and also a decrease in lean tissue mass. Um, so uh, also, in addition, they have a lower amount of active muscle mass and also a lower bone mineral density, which again then increases also the fracture risk. So those have to be taken into consideration if we uh, work on nutrition with those athletes. So then as well, uh, we could also see that resting energy expenditure decreases after the incidence of a spinal cord injury in the first two, uh, in the first weeks after the incident. So you can see here on this slide, it decreased uh, in the first sixth week, as well as after discharge when they went home from the rehabilitation clinic, it again decreased as well. If we look at resting energy expenditure in athletes, we can also see again, compared to those able-bodied controls, that again, resting energy expenditure is lower compared to those able-bodied controls. This was a measured resting energy expenditure. We can also try to predict the energy expenditure uh, in rest but as you can see here, um, the prediction equation are not very valid uh, for athletes with a spinal cord injury. So therefore, it's the better choice uh, to measure resting energy expenditure um, by indirect calometry 
and not use um, the prediction equation per se. If we then look at exercise energy expenditure, we can also see that uh, compared to able-bodied athletes, um, athletes uh, in wheelchair rugby uh, expend much less energy. Um, so if we um, compare it in calories, uh, it's around four kilocalories per minute, which they expend compared to 16 calories per minute with, uh, for the able-bodied uh, rugby players. If we compare it here on this slide to other sports disciplines, we can also see that in comparison to a tennis player or even a basketball player, a wheelchair rugby player expends much less energy and it equals around 250 calories per hour for a training session. So we have to take all um, those um, information into consideration when we uh, try to calculate the energy needs of an individual uh, from wheelchair rugby to estimate also the energy requirements, energy needs. But there are also further um, complications. Uh, for example, in, a, in an athlete with a spinal cord injury, we have very often urinary tract infection. We have uh, the symptom of neurogenic bladder and bowel. We have this prolonged gastrointestinal transition time. Very often they suffer also from pressure ulcer. Um, of course, the low bone mineral density, which results then often also in osteoporosis and the risk of uh, fracture. And also what Katie showed us uh, just before, also the impaired thermoregulation are further um, implication, which we need to take into account when giving any individualized recommendation to the athlete. So this, of course, can impact nutrition and hydration, um, but when, where, and why we need uh, uh, to take this into consideration, uh, we will di discuss this further on. So if we um, jump on to the macronutrients, I would like to start uh, with the protein intake. And uh, we published um, a review article on protein intake in athletes uh, with a spinal cord injury just this year. And you can see there are just a few studies looking at protein intake in athletes with a spinal cord injury. Um, this is uh, summarized just on the right side. And you can uh, clearly see that the intake ranged between 1.1 to 1.7 gram per kilogram per day. Um, so in Switzerland, uh, we would recommend just uh, a non-athlete uh, to have an intake of 0 0.8 gram per day per kilogram of body mass uh, for an athlete. Uh, the, for an able-bodied athlete, the recommendation would be to have an intake between 1.5 and 2.0 gram per kilogram per day. Uh, we can also see that um, often um, female athletes, uh, female wheelchair athletes showed a lower intake um, of protein um, in terms of kilogram of body mass. So of course, uh, this is not yet a guideline. This is just uh, looking at the intake. And unfortunately, there is uh, not not a lot of studies done uh, on protein supplementation or protein intake in regard of uh, different other topics like uh, muscle mass or muscle protein synthesis, for example. So nevertheless, we try to um, summarize all uh, the available information. We try to summarize all the studies in this review article. And we tried also to kind of find some recommendation, which, which are, of course, not real recommendation because there is a lack of a lot of studies. So there is a lot of work to do in the future in terms of protein uh, recommendation for athletes. But still, uh, we can 
go with some general protein recommendations. So um, we have seen that there might be some indicators uh, showing an increased need for protein intake. This could be, for example, if an athlete has a really high amount of active muscle mass, for example, an athlete with paraplegia or with an incomplete spinal cord injury. Um, also, they have an increased need if they have a, a pressure ulcer at the moment, for example, or if they want uh, to lose weight or preserve uh, fat-free mass during a late weight loss um, um, energy restriction. Also, if they have um, malnutrition or caloric restriction, then the, uh, the needs for protein intake um, increases. And of course, there might be as well some um, factors which might decrease um, the needs or the requirements uh, for a certain moment. Um, so this might be if there is a lower amount of active muscle mass or if there is any uh, current uh, kidney disease around or also sometimes um, protein intake might lead to constipation. Um, so this might also be a factor taken into account when giving individualized um, protein recommendations to the athlete. If we look um, at the carbohydrate um, intake, um, our master student Belinda Rittiman published just this year, um, as well as a review article on carbohydrate uh, guidelines. Um, so here uh, she summarized also all the studies looking at um, daily carbohydrate intake in athletes with spinal cord injury. And also here you can see um, that um, no study uh, looked at carbohydrate intake just in a wheelchair rugby team. Uh, so there are some studies uh, having included uh, wheelchair rugby athletes, but not uh, a study which um, looked just at one team. And also you can see that there is a high range of carbohydrate intake, of course, because of the different um, populations or the different sports included. Um, of course, we cannot compare the uh, wheelchair racing marathoner uh, with, with a games athlete or maybe even a, a shooting athlete, for example. So um, there is uh, a need for for future studies to really look at carbohydrate intake also in wheelchair rugby um, players and also for the guidelines for carbohydrate intake. Um, there is no uh, direct transfer from the carbohydrate guidelines from able-bodied athletes um, because of this change in body composition, uh, of the change in energy expenditure, resting energy expenditure, as well as um, exercise energy expenditure. So there might also be a lower glycogen storage capacity and possibly also a lower um, carbohydrate absorption. So this has to be uh, tested also in the future. And um, for, for myself, if I work with the athlete, I often choose this adapted carbohydrate intake uh, in relation to the activity, to the training load, to the training goal as well, um, and to the content of the training. So um, we look at an overall goal, whether there is weight loss uh, as a first goal or whether there is real um, performance optimization. And then we choose often this periodized carbohydrate intake approach to really support um, uh, this high quality training and probably also um, uh, losing weight at the same time, for example, if weight loss is a, is a goal. <laughs> 
but of course there is um, a lot of lack of, of, uh, of knowledge and uh, we need to know the energy requirements. So um, often I use also this resting energy expenditure measurement to estimate more properly uh, the needs of uh, the individual athlete. So also for a carbohydrate intake um, during uh, a game, for example, also there, uh, we only have this, um, um, these guidelines from the able-bodied athletes, uh, which probably is not a very accurate, um, but we try to stick with this a uh, bit because we think that um, it might um, serve them as well to, to have these carbohydrates. And for sure, it's not, um, not the goal to restrict energy during a game, um, um, but it's more um, to see in during the training phase to lose weight if weight loss, again, is, is the goal. So, um, so we stick with this 30 to 60 gram per hour uh, for the athletes uh, for, for a wheelchair rugby game. If we then, of course, um, talk about uh, nutrition uh, during the game, um, it's also uh, coming up with um, hydration guidelines. And so there have been uh, some studies looking at uh, sweat rate and they showed really low uh, sweat rate in wheelchair rugby uh, training. So the sweat rate uh, was um, below uh, 0 0.3 liters per hour. So in comparison to able-bodied athletes, uh, sometimes they show a uh, um, sweat rate of over one liter per hour. So it's really low in comparison. And this also showed in this impaired thermoregulation. So very often uh, we then see also overconsumption so that the athlete is heavier after um, the game than before. And this results also in a high urine output. So of course, uh, it, it's reasonable to determine uh, the individual uh, sweat rate to really have uh, individualized um, hydration guidelines for during a training session, but also for rehydration purposes, of course. And um, probably it's also as Katie uh, showed just before um, to have those both strategies um, kind of have these cooling strategies for really uh, the, the cooling of the body and not use um, the cold water, for example, just um, to cool the, the body um, because then this results again in overconsumption. So um, really have this individualized, uh, personalized uh, strategy for, for each athlete uh, would be the best. And of course, we can also educate the athlete um, in terms of um, the best or the optimal hydration um, to have kind of this hydration scale and look at the morning urine um, at the color and to as estimate for themselves whether um, they had a good hydration the day before or not. So um, I would like to switch now to the micronutrients and uh, as I explained just um, before, um, when we look at this energy expenditure, then of course this results in a, in a lower um, energy requirement and of course the nutrition has to be adapted. So um, this again then results of course in a lower energy intake compared to able-bodied individuals. And if we look, uh, for example, here in this study uh, on individuals with a spinal cord injury in a rehabilitation setting on the left side and the chronic uh, group, uh, which is an outpatient setting, uh, then we can clearly see that the micronutrient intake uh, was very low, um, for example, for vitamin D, vitamin E, folic acid, or also for iron. But what we 
do not know from here is um, the micronutrient status, for example. Um, so that's why uh, we have looked at uh, vitamin D deficiency in all the Swiss uh, wheelchair athletes um, some years back now. And we have found a very high prevalence of vitamin D insufficiency in those athletes and even a higher prevalence in the indoor athletes. So wheelchair rugby and wheelchair basketball. And also in addition to this, a very high prevalence uh, during the winter months um, as there is uh, not um, enough sun exposure uh, during winter times in Switzerland, of course, also the radiation and the angle, the steepness of the angle is not um, sufficient for vitamin D production. So uh, this leads me to the conclusion here that, of course, we have to do regular blood checks once or twice per year to check um, those micronutrients, uh, especially vitamin D, but of course also the iron status with the ferritin levels. We then did uh, another study um, with these uh, indoor wheelchair athletes, so mainly basketball and rugby athletes. And we uh, supplemented um, all those athletes with uh, um, vitamin D insufficiency with uh, vitamin D supplementation. So you can see here, uh, we gave them 6,000 international units per day over 12 weeks period. And all of them resulted in a sufficient status, e even in a very high vitamin D status. Following those uh, 12 weeks, uh, we supplemented them with the placebo product. And you can see again the drop in vitamin D status, even though those 12 weeks uh, were in the beginning of spring and during summer. So again, of course, um, this leads me to the conclusion that probably <laughs> The, the supplementation was a bit too high, but probably we also need um, to check uh, very often also the status and to make individualized um, supplementation guidelines for each athlete um, to be in an optimal serum vitamin D status. We then looked also in general at supplement use in those Swiss uh, wheelchair athletes. And you can see here uh, the results. Uh, so the, the results of the supplements they used. And um, we saw that uh, 40 to 60 percent of all the athletes were using um, supplements during training or competition, even though the evidence at that time was not yet really given uh, for the use or for the effectiveness of those supplements. So we then uh, took a further look in um, caffeine supplementation. And uh, in this graph, you can see um, the the infographic of Terry Graham Paulson, uh, which shows that the in intake of caffeine resulted in a significant increase in plasma caffeine concentration, um, also in athletes with the tetraplegia. But if uh, then when we looked at the um, performance effect of caffeine uh, supplementation uh, on a three minute uh, wheelchair uh, all out arm or crank ergometer test, then we could see that performance in the first 60 seconds of this three minutes was increased in able-bodied athletes as well as in uh, athletes uh, with a paraplegia. But we could also see a high uh, variability of the performance in those athletes or individuals with a tetraplegia. So um, we checked also 
norepinephrine and epinephrine levels and we couldn't see an increase in those levels in the individuals with the tetraplegia whereas we could see the increase in the other two groups so um, this leads me a bit to the conclusion that uh, the use of caffeine in athletes with a tetraplegia is or the evidence is not yet really given uh, in those athletes and of course we need again to test each supplement with each athlete to see whether it could be um, beneficial for, for uh, this individual or not. So as a take home message, uh, I would like to make uh, individualized recommendation based on uh, each athlete's um, whole characteristic of, of the injury. Um, taking into account all the consequences of the injury, of course, and plan the nutrition based on the individual requirements or needs based on the training, of course, and develop for each athlete an individual strategy or the best strategy um, to optimize health and of course also performance. So thank you very much uh, for the attention and also congratulations to Team GB for winning in Tokyo. Thank you, Dali. Uh, this is, uh, again, you know, every speaker's got such a great information to share. Um, there's one question in the uh, chat box. Oops, something just popped up. Let me get rid of that. Have you seen any links between increased UTIs and overconsumption in athletes with SEI during training camps or competition settings? Uh, I would say um, probably more um, a link when um, athletes went for training camp, for example, and they'd have to take a flight and they underconsume uh, for fluid intake. And then we can see that very often also with the change of the environment, we, with the change of uh, flying from cold Switzerland to a very warm uh, environmental um, um, condition, that then uh, they have uh, an increase or they, they have a, a, um, um, an urinary tract infection. Um, I think a couple of the other questions that are coming out, uh, and that was more questions for Dr. Uh, Griggs. Um, I do have a question. Um, you know, when you showed that one slide with the caffeine consumption uh, versus um, or supplement uh, and the performance, it seems like from a paraplegic standpoint from that 2015 study that they actually benefit. I mean, uh, the able body and the um, tetraplegics got some varied results. Um, so is it safe to say that at least for paraplegics, um, they can chew on some caffeine, um, coffee beans or something? Yeah, when we actually look at the whole three minutes, uh, there was no change. Um, so it was a, a three minute all out test like the Wingate test, but over three minutes. Um, so in average, there was no change in performance uh, for, for all groups. Um, but uh, if we look at the results for the first 30 and 60 seconds, then we could clearly see an increase in performance in those individuals uh, with, a, with a paraplegia. So uh, yes, all of them seem to uh, benefit in a certain way uh, from caffeine supplementation. Um, one other question is, you know, when we travel, I mean, all of you are more of an expert on this than I am. Um, uh, when we travel with these um, unique athletes, um, you know, their biggest concern is not having a bowel accident or bladder accident, um, knowing that they have a very uh, regimented uh, diet uh, programs because of those bowel programs. Um, and as they travel and, and get into a different country or anything, obviously dietary changes. Uh, and it's many times it's, un, it's hard for them to travel with their own type of food with them. Um, what will be a blanket statement? I know it's individualized. I'm going against what you just said. 
to help those who may be getting into this type of um, sports or those athletes are concerned about what would be a blanket statement to help them guide um, into this uh, uh, competition travel? Yeah, so um, if I work with the athlete uh, in a consulting way, then uh, we look, of course, at um, uh, the environmental condition, but also um, we look at the traveling. Um, so we make sure that they hydrate enough uh, during the flight, for example. Um, this can influence, um, of course, um, the whole immune system, um, but also as well the, the whole uh, urinary tract system and the bowel function. Um, so we were also working recently on uh, probiotics. Uh, so also this uh, might help uh, to have a certain um, prevention of, of uh, um, those um, bowel um, uh, issues. Um, so uh, also we trying to educate um, them as well to um, have their proper or their individual uh, fueling for the flight, for example, to not uh, um, having to eat what is available in the flight or having uh, to eat what is available at the airport, for example. Um, so there we can help a lot, and I think the athlete can can do a lot to prevent um, those um, those symptoms. Great, thank you. There's two questions in the chat box, but for interest in time, we're going to move forward. Joelle, if you can answer those questions in the chat box, we would really appreciate it. Thank yes, you. Of course. <laughs> okay, going to our last speaker. This has been really great. Um, I'd like to introduce Francesca, Dr. Francesca, well, uh, I'm going to kill this last name, uh, Boswit. If you can correct me later, please let me know. Uh, she's a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Calgary and the uh, Swiss Paraplegic Center investigating shoulder health and its biomechanical determinants in wheelchair users. So her talk is uh, shoulder tendon health in wheelchair rugby athletes. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, can you see my screen? No? Uh, yes, we can see your screen. How do you say your last name? You, you actually did pretty well. It's a boss eight. Boss eight. Okay, thank boss you. Eight. Yes, very good. <laughs> Thanks. And thank you for the invitation also um, to Vicky. It's a great pleasure for me to talk to you today. And thanks to everyone for sticking around for this last, my last talk. So I'll talk to you about the work that I uh, conducted during my PhD and my postdoc while I was at the Swiss Paraplegic Research in Switzerland. So the Swiss Paraplegic Research is part of the Swiss Paraplegic Group, which offers a unique set of services that aim to improve um, the lives of persons with a spinal cord injury with um, services that range from acute care at the specialized clinic uh, to rehabilitation, reintegration into life, training Paralympic athletes, um, at the sport medicine, also where Joel and Claudio are. Um, and so I was, uh, or I'm still part from the shoulder health and mobility group that's part at the Swiss Paraplegic Research, which is located in this F-shaped building. That stands for Forschung, which means research in German. And the shoulder health and mobility group aims to improve shoulder mobility and functioning in persons with a spinal cord injury. And it's clear that shoulder functioning is fundamental for persons who almost completely rely on their upper extremities for activities of daily living, mobility and sports. And obviously uh, this is also the case for our wheelchair rugby athletes. And it's not surprising that an extreme sport like wheelchair rugby places great demands on the upper extremities, which likely increases the risk of shoulder pain. And shoulder pain has been related to the propulsion activities themselves. For example, uh, the high acceleration, deceleration starts and stops during the game place great demands on the shoulder, but also the overhead activities like throwing or catching the ball. And um, the direct impact of shoulder pain on every aspect of the person's life um, call for the need to improve injury prevention. And to do so, we need to have an in-depth understanding of both the demands on the shoulder as well as the capacity to meet those demands. And the most uh, common diagnosis, diagnosis of shoulder pain is um, referred to the subacromial pain syndrome, which is any non-traumatic shoulder problem that causes pain uh, 
around the acromion. The acromion is part of the shoulder blades and in between the acromion and the humerus, which is part of the upper arm, we have this subacromial space in which we have the supraspinatus tendon and the long head of the biceps tendon. And both of these tendons are the most common sites of injury in wheelchair users. And tendons connect muscles to bones and they play a role, an important role in storage and release of energy. And they also have a high metabolic activity, which means that they adapt to changing at demands. And this on itself offers an opportunity for injury and rehabilitation um, and injury prevention. So we can visualize tendon with ultrasound imaging, which is uh, a popular tool that is low cost, uh, easy to use and non-invasive. And if we uh, visualize a healthy tendon, uh, here, for example, we can see a biceps tendon in between these bright white lines, we see these distinct black and white uh, horizontal lines that represent the collagen fibers that comprise the tendon. Now with um, mechanical overloading, repetitive um, overloading, we can induce micro damage to these collagen fibers, which can, really, which can lead to chronic tendon degeneration and ultimately to tendon rupture. For example, here I'm showing a biceps tendon of a wheelchair rugby athlete, where we can see that the tendon looks thicker. We don't see such nice um, horizontal black and white lines. And we maybe see here some fluid in the tendon as well. So we uh, research has shown, um, although obviously there are individual differences, that there's chronic tendon adaptation in wheelchair users related to tendinopathy. But uh, there is limited information on the acute tendon responses to loading, uh, for example, gameplay or fatigue and tasks uh, on the tendon, which over time may lead to this chronic tendon degeneration. So if we want to better understand the development of injuries, we need to have an understanding of acute tendon adaptations and how this leads to chronic tendon degeneration. And this brought me uh, to my PhD um, in, in, in Notville, where I wanted to answer the question um, or to examine the effect of acute loading or fatiguing wheelchair propulsion on the risk factors for shoulder pain in persons with a spinal cord injury. And the last project within my PhD specifically investigated how the supraspinatus and the biceps tendon adapt uh, to fatiguing wheelchair propulsion. And to do such assess assessments, we uh, used quantitative ultrasound protocols, which have been developed and validated at the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, so I visited their labs to learn these methods. And these allow minimal error in probe location um, at different time points. So if you want to test the tendon before and after a gameplay, before and after a specific task, you can do that by um, sticking this metal marker here onto the skin. And if you then take an ultrasound image uh, while including the marker, we can see uh, two black vertical lines on the ultrasound image. From there, we can then calculate the region of interest of the tendon. So again, here, the biceps tendon is between these bright white lines and we manually define then the upper and the lower border of the tendon. And then in between the lines, we have our region of interest from which we can calculate the thickness of the tendon or the uh, mean uh, width um, between the horizontal green lines, as well as uh, the tendon appearance or the grayscale. And this is related to um, the echogenicity. So if there is a, a lower echogenicity, this would mean that the tendon is darker. And this shows that there may be acute influx of water into the tendon, for example, in response to the activity that we induced. We can then also look at the echogenicity ratio, which is the grayscale of the tendon relative to the grayscale of the muscle above the tendon. And, um, and these protocols have been used before uh, before and after gameplay, as well as before and after a fatiguing task, uh, which we call the figure eight fatigue protocol. And this protocol includes three times four minutes of wheelchair propulsion along this eight-shaped course, including right and left turns and starts and stops. These activities are also uh, typically during gameplay. Um, and this is the only protocol so far that induces fatigue with overground propulsion. So we used the protocol uh, for my experiments where we tested 50 wheelchair users with a spinal cord injury. 
they all had a paraplegia. And um, so we tested their uh, biceps and their supraspinatus tendon before and after this figure eight fatigue protocol, as well as a lot of other assessments um, that took place in between. But I'll focus on the ultrasound examinations for now. And we then looked how um, the tendon thickness, for example, changed before and after the task. So we looked at the absolute um, difference in tendon characteristics. And we um, then controlled for um, susceptibility to fatigue, activity levels, body weight, and the acromiofemoral distance. And what we found was that following the figure eight fatigue protocol, uh, there was a significant reduction in supraspinatus tendon thickness, um, which is a normal response of tendon to its alignment of the fibers in the direction of the applied stress. Um, however, with um, potentially insufficient time to recover, this may lead over time to um, micro damage and chronic degeneration. Interestingly, we also found that there was an association between supraspinatus thickness and body weight. More specifically, persons who are actually heavier even demonstrated an increase in supraspinatus thickness uh, following the task. And this is related to reactive uh, tendinopathy or acute inflammation that may be related to uh, fluid inflow into the tendon. Now, while I was presenting uh, these findings at uh, the Rehab Move, Con uh, Rehab Move Congress in Groningen in 2018, um, or um, following my presentation, um, Vicky came to me and, and she was very interested in these uh, quantitative ultrasound protocols. And we discussed how to potentially include them into the yearly screening of the athletes um, where they already test their aerobic and their anaerobic capacity. And so we had uh, a lot of interesting discussions and this led to an invitation for me to come to their lab in Loughborough where we collected data with their wheelchair rugby athletes. Um, and so the goal of, um, of, this, of this collaboration was to answer the question how the biceps and the supraspinatus tendon adapt following a graded exercise to maximum exhaustion when the musculoskeletal system is uh, prone to adaptation. So when we really push the athletes uh, and then also when looking at this highly trained wheelchair of the athletes. And we also wanted to know if there are any chronic adaptations related to the impairment as um, previous research is mainly focused on persons with a spinal cord injury. And finally, we wanted to see if we really look at one athlete um, who has unilateral shoulder pain, how, um, how does a tendon, biceps and supraspinatus tendon adapt in this uh, situation? So these results were presented at different conferences and uh, the publication is currently under review, um, but I'll show you uh, our main findings now. So we again performed the same quantitative ultrasound protocols. We tested the biceps and the supraspinatus tendon, and we also took images of the acromion femoral distance. And this is the distance between the acromion and the humerus or the upper arm. And the larger the space um, or the distance, the more space there is for the tendon. So if the space is reduced, this can cause impingement of the tendon and irritation and leads to degeneration. We tested 12 uh, highly trained national level wheelchair rugby players, including 11 males and one female player. And uh, in this group, we had uh, eight persons with a tetraplegic spinal cord injury and four persons with a non spinal impairment. Bef after we had the pre ultrasound and examinations, the athletes uh, were strapped in and uh, went uh, on the treadmill where we performed the graded exercise test to maximum exhaustion. This test was preceded with a 10 minute self selected warm up, then a rest uh, of five minutes. Then there was a submaximal test lasting about 20 minutes, followed by 30 minutes um, pause. And then we had the exercise test of the maximum exhaustion lasting about 10, 10 minutes. And uh, here you can see also on the shoulder that we have so the marker states to the skin during the task. So we can take the images at the same location pre post. And following this test, um, we then found that there were acute tendon adaptations in the biceps tendon when controlling for the impairment um, and the acromohumal uh, and the occupation ratio, which is the occupation of the tendon within the acromohumal distance. So what we found was that there was a significant reduction in biceps echogenicity 
following the task. And uh, biceps echogenicity, as I uh, mentioned before, relates to the grayscale of the region of interest. And so if this is reduced, this means that there is uh, acute fluid inflow into the tendon, which can be a response of acute overload and uh, relates to reactive tendinopathy. And over time, this may lead to chronic tendon degeneration with insufficient time to recover um, or shoulder problems. Now, this finding was in line with a previous study from Van Dronglen et al, who tested 42 wheelchair athletes, uh, basketball and wheelchair rugby before and after game play, uh, where they found a reduction in the biceps echogenicity ratio and um, relates and um, supports that there are acute changes in the biceps tendon in, in these athletes. Now, this is, um, we, as we did not find changes in the supraspinatus pre post the task, uh, we cannot uh, confirm the findings from the previous study I conducted in Switzerland, and this is likely related to the difference in population, the 50 wheelchair users, including athletes, non-athletes, population-based sample versus a very specific sample of wheelchair rugby athletes. Furthermore, the task was different, um, and the athletes were in their wheelchair rugby chair versus the daily chair in the test in, in Switzerland. And all of this supports the need um, of the, or the task dependency uh, on tendon adaptations um, and potentially also uh, the development of injuries. Um, now, furthermore, it was found when we looked at the chronic tendon adaptations that persons with a spinal cord injury uh, actually had a significantly thicker supraspinatus tendon as compared to persons with a non-spinal impairment. And this may be related to either a hypertrophy or a strengthening of the tendon by increasing the stiffness or maybe related to overloads uh, or inflammation uh, and, and chronic degeneration. Now, um, the lack of trend control in the persons with a tetraplegia is li likely plays a role in differences in shoulder loads um, and then also altered tendon adaptations. And differences in functioning were also, were also supported with the lower VO2 uh, peak of the persons with a spinal cord injury um, and they also spend less time in the gym. But overall, these findings support the need um, to individualize, again, as has been said before today multiple times, that we need to individualize and consider different impairments, especially also when looking at tendon adaptations uh, and monitoring tendon adaptations over time. Finally, uh, here we also found that there was an association between a greater occupation ratio. So a greater occupation ratio means that the tendon is taking up more space uh, in the acromiofemoral distance. Uh, so less space between the tendon and the acromion. And this was related consistently with signs of tendinopathy. Uh, it was associated with lower echogenicity and echogenicity ratio, as well as with a greater biceps uh, and supraspinatus thickness. And this supports that the occupation ratio may be an interesting variable to uh, include in assessments when monitoring uh, tendon adaptations. Finally, we then looked at uh, one um, highly trained national uh, player with a tetraplegia who had unilateral shoulder pain. So the symptomatic shoulder, um, the pain was reported moderate to severe three times per week. And for those familiar with the RUSPI score, uh, was about 40.3. So very high uh, levels of, of shoulder pain. And what we found was that if we look at the supraspinatus tendon here, that there were um, no changes in the symptomatic tendon, while there was a significant reduction in tendon thickness of the asymptomatic tendon. And, um, and this is um, not really in line with what I've shown previously. So we had a closer look at both shoulders. And we also did the Wingate test in this athlete. And what we found was that um, the symptomatic shoulder, while it had a high peak power than the asymptomatic shoulder, there was a greater fatigue index, which means that there was a greater drop in peak power during the test. So it can be that with pain, there is inhibition um, uh, of the musculoskeletal system to protect the system. And uh, therefore, there could have been this drop, which um, can then increase greater loads on the asymptomatic side because it has to take up more um, as, uh, as from the beginning, and therefore potentially could have resulted in the tendon adaptation of the supraspinatus. However, these are speculations. Um, 
and we need more data from um, more athletes also over uh, longer time periods to uh, make any conclusions about uh, cause and, and effects. But this supports also what I've been mentioned before that it is important to look at uh, potential asymmetries between shoulders also in terms of not only looking at peak power but also looking at uh, fatigue index. And uh, this may potentially help to guide training programs um, and, and balance uh, both sides. Um, so in conclusion, um, it was found that there are uh, acute and chronic tendon adaptations in wheelchair rugby athletes that were related to the um, uh, impairment of the athlete. And these findings support uh, the use of ultrasound in the, in the monitoring of the athlete that can be easily implemented in the screening together with the aerobic and anaerobic capacity test. And it would provide us with longitudinal data of tendon adaptations and potentially may help us to um, intervene before um, it is already um, at a further stage. And so we need a long-term, to investigate the long-term consequences of these fatigue-induced changes and monitor tendon health with ultrasound and also to identify intervention studies to preserve shoulder health. And um, musculoskeletal research has stagnated because of the lack of understanding how muscles and tendons interact, specifically how forces during everyday life impact the variable tendon strain. And this is what brought me to my postdoc here in Calgary, um, where I am currently, um, which aims to quantify tendon and muscle strain during dynamic movement in vivo and validate a wireless passive electronic strain sensor for maybe over some time um, ex experiments in humans as well. And this project is funded from the Swiss National Science Foundations and is a collaboration with the ETH in Zurich, uh, the Lo Laboratory for Movement Biomechanics. So I hope that upon my return in Switzerland that I can use my experience to uh, further improve uh, individualized shoulder rehabilitation for wheelchair users and uh, wheelchair athletes. So um, thanks to um, everyone involved, um, my uh, Dr. Michael Bollinger from the University of Pittsburgh, Dr. Yusina Arnett from the Swiss Paraplegic Research, Dr. Amkos from Ghent, as well as the whole group in at the Swiss Paraplegic Research uh, to support medicine for using their ultrasound device, the invitation from Vicky Tolfrey at the Loughborough University and the funding that allowed to conduct this very exciting research, uh, which I really uh, hope we can continue. So uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, that was great. Um, uh, obviously, uh, shoulder health is one of our most uh, kind of a priority for all our athletes that are in wheelchair. Um, uh, while we wait uh, for any um, questions on the chat box, uh, we do wish uh, you know you continue on with your work and uh, hopefully those technology and these little micro devices uh, can be um, developed that can monitor all our athletes in a um, kind of a in person or on the move kind of um, data collections and then show us something. Um, one thing I have is, uh, you know, the development as you test these shoulders uh, for many different uh, research, along with that, all the audience here, I, I guess, I'm very interested to know how to ar artificially um, create fatigue for, for those researchers who want to do these type of research and stuff. Um, I, I've seen uh, on your talk that there are several um, articles you cite or you developed your own figure eight kind of uh, uh, fatiguing uh, system. Uh, are there any studies that causes um, that validated some of the uh, fatigue um, in, in our uh, population? Yeah, so um, the figure eight protocol was developed before by the group uh, at the University of Pittsburgh, and they had tested it before, um, also in combination with the ultrasound examinations. Um, and this is the only protocol so far that has the overground propulsion. So the goal with um, when you want to induce fatigue is that you replicate um, the situation as much as you can. So obviously, ideally, you would do tests before and after actual gameplay where you induce fatigue as it actually takes place. Um, but so this figure eight protocol allows to test um, outside of, of the of the um, court and do very do much more detailed experiments. So the protocol was uh, tested before and we well, we defined fatigue with a change in heart rate and a change in rate of perceived exertion. And one of the 
project of my PhD was also to look at EMG. So we saw that there was um, changes in the frequency signal um, in only a subset of the muscles with fatigue uh, following the task. So we, with these um, results, we could show that there was fatigue in these specific muscles following the task. And we then defined uh, fatigue as an increase of both um, heart rate and rate of perceived exertion when athletes performed um, a treadmill propulsion at a specific power output before and after the task. So basically they're doing exactly the same task at the same power output, but with and without fatigue. And if they then had a significant increase in their heart rate and their rate of perceived exertion, when they did the same task following fatigue, we identified them as being fatigued. Um, we didn't do any physiological tests uh, like uh, lactate tests in my experiment in Switzerland, but that's why it was really nice to have uh, the aerobic capacity tests um, where you actually define the VO2 max uh, and you have lactate uh, and more physiological measures of, of fatigue. Great, thank you. There's one question by Melinda Ernest. Um, uh, I would love to see EMG activation or HHD strength of lateral teres major uh, has a relationship with biceps or superintendent um, adaptations post-testing. Do you know if anything like this is in the literature? Sorry, which muscle was it? Lateral? It seems like uh, lateral and teres major. Okay. Um, so the problem with, with EMG and um, we all, so for my experience, we only looked at at, this, at the big shoulder muscles, so the pectoralis, the deltoideus, and the upper and lower traps, um, and the and the biceps. So the problem is that um, we have the interference of the wheelchair um, that makes it difficult to perform certain EMG experiments. But my goal um, for future experiments when I go back to Switzerland would be to have uh, also fine wire EMG of the supraspinatus tendon because there is some uh, research, older research that has worked on uh, from Sarah Mulroy that has worked on done fine wire EMG experiments during wheelchair propulsion. Um, and I would like to do that um, again, but from more also deeper shoulder muscles um, to then have a better understanding of uh, the muscle activation and ultimately be able to predict muscular activation from the forces applied on the push rim and the kinematics. Um, so I think there's still a lot of research that can be done. Um, and yeah, and specifically on the EMG side. Thank you. Um, we don't have any more uh, thing, but as we wait for more questions, um, thank you, uh, Francisca. This has been great. I mean, I have to say, on behalf of the uh, World uh, Wheelchair Rugby Federation and our uh, partner with the Lowborough University, that um, our first um, uh, conference here, a symposium, uh, I feel like it's a huge success with all of your, I mean, great intelligence uh, coming together. I feel like this little tiny minuscule of a person in, in this. Um, in this sport. Um, so I would like to thank everyone for participating in this and also uh, joining in on listening to this as well. Um, uh, Vicky, I'm gonna um, hand it back to you. Again, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Ken. Um, on this note, we actually, uh, looking at my schedule over here, we have actually got um, a break um, and then we're then wrapping up in a last sort of panel discussion. I'm hoping that we don't necessarily lose people by that stage, um, because obviously it's always the case that we want to be shooting off places. So if we can um, stretch our legs, wave our arms, do a little bit of exercise, then um, we'll perhaps be looking to get back together. Um, we've got a panel discussion that's chaired by Viola, I don't know if Viola wants to just, um, if, if she put her on the spot, or she might actually be sorting her roof out at this moment in time. But uh, I didn't know whether she just wanted to switch her camera on just to give a bit of a backdrop to that. So to entice us to come back in 10 minutes. I mean, to me, it's an important wrap up um, and a panel discussion um, with, uh, with Jans.
Um, I'll let you, you describe it a little bit more, Viola, but I guess my point is, is uh, we would very much like to engage just a bit at the end in terms of some discussion around future directions and collaborations and things like that. So over to you, Viola, just to do a sales pitch and then we can then have five or ten minutes to stretch. Um, I'm not entirely sure if everyone can see me now. I've switched on my camera and my uh, microphone. Yeah, we can see you, Viola. Okay. So um, um, I think after the break, uh, I will do a wrap-up session together with Jens. And Jens is an athlete from Germany um, who is also the athlete representative for uh, World Wheelchair Rugby. And he's also involved in science. So that makes him a very interesting person to talk to, I think. Uh, and he knows a lot about all the aspects of the game from all sides. Um, and I'm happy to, to do the wrap up, to answer any questions, to have a discussion on where we should move in future and science in wheelchair rugby. So I hope to see you all in five minutes uh, after some stretches. Thanks, Viola. I'll let um, um, Sven, if he's still with us, just pop a little screen up in case people don't really know what's happening and that they've missed it. So uh, let's see everybody in about uh, five to eight minutes time. Thanks. <laughs> 